Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together, fellowshipping on the 16th of the second month. It is the 21st Yom, or day, of counting the Omar. And we are continuing with our study of the recognitions of Clement, where we left off at a footnote talking about what was coming up might seem a, a little weird to our modern comprehension of things. But um, I wanted to reiterate real quick, and we're going to share a few different things so we can get the context for what's trying to be shared. But the whole purpose is that everything that he shared, like Shaul mentions in one of his epistles, what was written before is for our instruction. And Yahushua speaks to everyone in parables, but it's to his taught ones that he reveals the secret things or what they actually mean. And this is a theme you can see throughout these different writings as well. In particular here, we're going to focus on what the animal or what the dietary instructions were supposed to teach. They're still applicable for today, but the whole purpose of them is to teach men righteousness. And that's ob willing. That's what we'll see. So to go ahead and continue here, this is from chapter 25. It says, but what will I say of plants and what of animals? Is it not providence that has ordained that plants when they decay by old age should be reproduced by the suckers or the seeds that they have themselves produced and animals by propagation and by a certain wonderful dispensation of providence Milk is prepared in the udders of the dams or females for the animals before they are born. And as soon as they are born, with no one to guide them, they seek out the store of nourishment provided for them. And not only males are produced, but females also, that by means of both the race may be perpetrated, or sorry, <laughs> perpetuated i'm sorry but at least this should seem as some think to be done by a certain order of nature and not by the appointment of the creator he has as a proof and indication of his providence ordained a few animals to preserve their stock on the earth in an exceptional way for example the crow conceives through the mouth and this is not a literal scientific fact that they have that process, but the way that they can or the things that they would do by holding their young in their mouth and then having it come out of it, they would carry them around that way for safekeeping. And so men would perceive this. And these things were actually done in reality to teach us things. That's the whole point. So while it says crows conceive with their mouth, it's not literal. It's just what you can perceive if you observe nature. And that's the other things that you'll see as well. And the weasel brings forth through the ear. This is the one that seems rather confusing. And it's where the letter of Aristides, which we'll cover in just a moment, clarifies it very much. But the intention is that the weasel takes in through the ear and then spews out through the mouth everything that it hears. And that's not a characteristic that should be emulated. <clears throat> it says, in some birds, such as hens, sometimes produce eggs conceived of wind or dust. Other animals convert the male into the female and change their sex every year as hares and hyenas which they call monsters. Others spring forth from the earth and get their bodies from it as moles, others from ashes as vipers, others from putrefying flesh as wasps from horse flesh and bees from ox flesh. And if you know what the horse represents and what the wasp is, and then what the bee represents and what the ox is, those things are meant to teach man if you think about them, but it's all parable form. 
relating to what his word says about these topics. So I'm willing, you can start to see the pattern here. And this is exactly why if you look back in the end of second Shalomo and first Kings where, or sorry, second Samuel, Shemuel and first Kings where Shalomo started to reign and he was endowed with Hokma and intelligence. He was talking about creation, the birds, the bees, the trees, and how things functioned. This is others from cow dung as beetles, others from herbs as the scorpion from basil, and again, herbs from animals as parsley and asparagus from the horn of the stag or the she goat. All right, and I think that's a good place to stop here for a moment because it goes on to trees and other things. So before we move on for that topic, I wanted to cover what it mentions in a few other places about animals and what it represents in scripture so you get a more clear picture. The first section here is from the Epistle of Barnabas, which <clears throat> As with all these writings, you're going to find some parts that have been tampered with. So you have to be mindful of that and always want to check using multiple sources to confirm every matter that's established truth. So just as it says in scripture, two or more witnesses establish everything. But right here, it says, starting at chapter 10, verse 1. It says, for, but for as much as Moshe said. You shall not eat sign, nor eagle, nor falcon, nor crow, nor any fish which has no scale upon it. He received his, in his comprehension three ordinances. Yea, and further he said unto them in Deuteronomy, And I will lay as a covenant upon this people my ordinances. So then it is not a commandment of Elohim, that they should not bite with their teeth. But Moshe spake in the Ruach. Accordingly, he mentioned the swine with this intent. You shall not cleave, said he, to such men who are like unto swine. That is, when they are in luxury, they forget Yahuwah. But when they are in want, they recognize Yahuwah. Just as the swine, when it eats, knows not his master, but when it is hungry, it cries out, and when it has received food again, it is silent. Neither shall you eat the eagle, nor falcon, nor kite, nor crow. You shall not, said he, cleave unto or be likened to such men who now not or who know not how to provide food for themselves by toil and sweat, but in their lawlessness seize what belongs to others. And as if they were walking in guilelessness, watch and search about for someone to rob in their rapacity. Just as these birds alone do not provide food for themselves, but sit idle and seek how they may eat the meat that belongs to others, being pestilent in their evil doings. And you shall not eat, saith he, lamprey, nor pulpus, nor cuddle fish. You shall not, he means, become like unto such men who are desperately wicked and are already condemned to death, just as these fishes alone are accursed and swim in the depths, not swimming on the surface like the rest, but dwell on the ground beneath the deep sea. Moreover, you shall not eat the hair. Why so? You shall not be found a corrupter of boys, nor shall you become like such persons. For the hair gains one passage in the body every year. See, this is where it's messed with a little weird, but in the other version you just read, they can be hermaphrodite, or they show characteristics where they're not discriminant in doing things <clears throat> and all these are representative characters to teach men what not to do this is according to the number of 
years it lives, it has just so many orifices. Again, neither shall you eat the hyena, for shall or you shall not, said he, become an adulterer or a fornicator. Neither shall you resemble such persons. Why so? Because this animal changes its nature year by year and becomes at one time male and at another female. Moreover, he has hated the weasel also, and with good reason. You shall not, said he, become such as those men of whom we hear as working inequity with their mouth for uncleanness. Neither shall you cleave unto impure women who work inequity with their mouth, for this animal conceives with its mouth. And see, that this is perverted. It's not quite the intention of what it was sharing. But we'll continue. It says, concerning meats, then Moshe received three decrees to this effect and uttered them in a ruachni or spiritual sense. But they accepted them according to the lust of the flesh as though they referred to eating. And it did refer to eating, but not exclusively. And Dawid also received knowledge of the same three decrees and said, Prosperous is the man who has not gone into the counsel of the unrighteous. Even as the fishes go in darkness into the depths, right? And I want to point out in one of Irenaeus's writings, I believe it's against heresies, but it might be in the demonstration of the apostolic preaching. He mentions this very verse from Psalm 1. And he breaks it down into the three ways that men are. But it says, prosperous is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the wicked, meaning those that don't know the law and do evil. And then this one equates it to the fishes that go about in darkness and they're in death without the breath of life. Right? Right here it says, and has not stood in the path of sinners. Irenaeus equates those that have heard the law, but don't do it. And it says, this is just as they who pretend to fear Yahuwah sin like, like swine or pigs. And has not sat on the seat of destroyers or the pestilential, as it's mentioned by Irenaeus. And he says, these are the ones who not only believe wrongly, but teach other men so like a pestilential disease-ridden being that infects others. And he says, as the birds that are seated for prey. And you have now the complete lesson concerning eating. <clears throat> so it says, again, Moshe said, you shall everything that divides the hoof and chews the cud. What means he? He that receives the food knows him that gives him the food, and being refreshed, appears to rejoice in him. Well, said he, having regard to the commandment, what then means he? Cleave unto those that fear Yahuwah with those who meditate in their heart on the distinction of the word which they have received, with those who tell of the ordinances of Yahuwah and keep them, with those who know that meditation is a work of gladness and who chew the cud of the word of Yahuwah. But why that which divides the hoof? Because the righteous man both, walk, both walks in this world and at the same time looks for the set-apart world to come. You see how prudent a lawgiver Moshe was, or Hakam wise. All right, and then I do believe it moves on from there. So that was the part, but Abel, and you can see a continued theme where it's the characteristics of these animals that are teaching men or teaching his children what not to do <clears throat> the last one here and this one we're, we're going to read the whole thing it's really 
isn't part of anything that I've ever heard is considered scripture. But for context, the, the letter of Aristides, halibut has fins and scales, and it's actually something that is... In the 1950s, there was a doctor who did some scientific studies testing the muscle juices and ex extracts from all the animals clean and unclean on its effect on growing a certain type of legume or a plant. And he found that everything that was considered clean was non-harmful to the growth. And some things, some animal meat juices was even beneficial like the halibut was 103 or 107 percent so it actually caused it to be better off by using it than by not but all of the clean animals were non-toxic and every one of the animals that are considered unclean were actually toxic for the plant and it's toxic for anyone who consumes it and again that's a study that was done in the 1950s but halibut has fins and scales and it's actually one of the best fish to eat Excuse me. <clears throat> so the excerpt from the letter of Aristides, the letter of Aristides was originally written by Aristides to a, a friend of his, and he was recounting the events that had transpired when they, he had been the ambassador for Ptolemy to go and petition Eleazar the Kohen to allow scribes to come and write the Septuagint for them or make a copy of the scriptures in Greek that he could keep in his library that he was building. And this is an account of that. When he went as an ambassador, he had spoken with them and he'd asked certain questions and whatnot. And this is part of what was going on there. <clears throat> the whole letter actually describes the land of Yarushalayim, the surrounding area, what it looks like, the Hekel at the time, what an offering and worship service looked like with all the Kohanim were doing and everyone working in unison and silence is pretty amazing. But he also enumerates the gifts that were made by Ptolemy and gifted to Yahuwah and the Hekel. And then the interactions between their discussing and coming to an agreement on the making of the Septuagint when the 72 came over the feast that they had and then questioning them they went through a series of times where the ptolemy would give questions and they were very difficult questions that these men were spare the moment i mean right off the cuff answering and always giving esteem to to yahoo elohim so it's pretty amazing the whole thing is rather rather fantastic i very much enjoyed it <clears throat> but again with all these writings there's some things that might seem a little off so you want to be mindful right here. It says, this is part of the interaction. It gets right into the reading. It is worthwhile to mention briefly the information which he gave in reply to our questions. For I suppose that most men feel a curiosity with regard to some of the enactments in the Torah, especially those about meats and drinks and animals recognized as unclean. When we asked, since there is but one form of creation, some animals are regarded as unclean for eating, and others unclean even to touch. For though the law is scrupulous on most points, it is specially scrupulous on such matters as these. And what he means is, if you look through the dietary instructions, some animals were clean for whatever use, some things were unclean, and you were not to touch the dead carcass of them. And some things were abominable and you were not to touch them at all. The context was on what he had determined by what he said. And it was all to teach you the different characteristics and his reaction or regard to them. Excuse me. When we asked why, since there is but one form of creation, some animals are regarded as unclean for eating and others as unclean even to touch. For though the law is scrupulous on most points, it is especially scrupulous on such matters as these. He began his reply as follows. 
You observe, he said, what an effect our modes of life and our associations produce upon us. By associating with the bad, men catch their depravities and become miserable throughout their life. But if they live with the wise and prudent, they find the means of escaping from ignorance and amending their lives or inner beings. Our lawgiver first of all laid down the principles of piety and righteousness and inculcated them point by point, not merely by prohibitions, but by the use of examples as well, demonstrating the injurious effects of sin and the punishments inflicted by Elohim upon the guilty. For he first, sorry, for he proved first of all that there is only one Elohim and that his power is manifested throughout the creation. Since every place is filled with his sovereignty and none of the things which are wrought in secret by men upon the earth escapes his knowledge. For all that a man does and all that is to come to pass in the future are manifest to him. Working out these truths carefully, and having made them plain, he showed that even if a man should think of doing evil, to say nothing of actually affecting it, he would not escape detection. For he made clear, sorry, for he made it clear that the power of El pervaded the whole of the Torah. He desire, and this is my own comment here, it says he desires his Torah in our inward parts, Psalm 40, verse 8. Beginning from this starting point, we, he went on to show that all mankind except ourselves believe in the existence of many mighty ones, though they themselves are much more powerful than the beings whom they vainly worship. For when they have made statues of stone and wood, they say that they are the images of those who have invented something useful for life and they worship them though they have clear proof that they possess no feeling. For it would be utterly foolish to suppose that anyone became a mighty one in virtue of his inventions. For the inventors simply took certain objects already created, and by combining them together, showed that they possess a fresh utility. And this is something that we've done throughout time in history. Velcro was part of what we discovered with bird feathers, flight and aerodynamics through the, through the way the animals work. Uh, we just rip off nature left and right. And well, not rip off. We learn from what he's created. And we, we devise these things into fresh utility, just like he mentions right here. This is and originally men would be clever and come up with things that were beneficial. And then they would be worshipped by those that came after them. And this is, a, again, something that Kepha speaks about in the recognitions and condemns as well. This is, they did not themselves create the substance of the thing. And so it is a vain and foolish thing for men to make mighty ones of men like themselves. For in our times, there are many who are much more inventive and much more learned than the men of former days who have been deified, and yet they would never come to worship them. The makers and authors of these myths think that they are the wisest of the Greeks. Why need we speak of other infatuated tribes, Egyptians and the like, who place their reliance upon wild beasts and most kinds of creeping things and cattle? and worship them, and offer sacrifices to them, both while living and when dead. Now our lawgiver, being a hakam or wise man, and specially endowed by Elohim to comprehend all things. And I want you to remember, he was an image, he was a type and shadow of our Mashiach that was to come. So the things that are mentioned about Moshe are things that our Mashiach also claims to be of himself. And another thing that's mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
there's one of the writings that talk about Moshe is a man whom Elohim spoke out of his own mouth like it was him speaking himself. And that's the very claim that our Mashiach said. If you've heard me, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what I hear, I speak. So it's the same pattern. But some people take offense to these things right here. The problem with that, though, is it was the very intention of it to show that what our Mashiach would be like and who he is. He's the one himself, Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, who spoke to Moshe from the burning bush and told him that he was going to be an Elohim to Pharaoh. He says, now our lawgiver being a wise man and especially doubt or endowed by Elohim to comprehend all things, took a comprehensive view of each particular detail and fenced us round with impregnable ramparts and walls of iron that we might not mingle at all with any of the other nations, but remain pure in body and inner being, free from all vain imaginations, worshiping the one El Shaddai above the whole creation. Hence the leading Egyptian priests, having looked carefully into many matters and being cognizant with our affairs, call us men of Elohim. This is a title which does not belong to the rest of mankind, but only to those who worship the true Elohim. The rest of men are not of El, but of meats and drinks and clothing, for their whole disposition leads them to find solace in these things. Among our tribes, such things are reckoned of no account, but throughout their whole life, their main consideration is the sovereignty of Elohim. Therefore, lest we should be corrupted by any abomination or our inner beings be perverted by evil communications. It could be our lives like our, our chai, right? He hedged us round on all sides by rules of purity affecting alike what we eat or drink or touch or see or hear i'm sorry or hear or see let's get those out and if you haven't noticed by now i'm dyslexic so sometimes i'll i'll skip a word like that i'm better at it than i used to be <laughs> for those speaking generally all things are alike in their natural constitution since they are all governed by one and the same power Yet there is a deep reason in each individual case why we abstain from the use of certain things and enjoy the common use of others. For the sake of illustration, I will run over one or two points and explain them to you. For you must not fall into the degrading idea that it was out of regard to mice and weasels and other such things that Moshe drew up his laws with such exceeding care. All these ordinances were made for the sake of righteousness, to aid the quest for virtue and the perfecting of character. For all the birds that we use are tame and distinguished by their cleanliness, feeding on various kinds of grain and pulse, such as, for instance, pigeons, turtle doves, locusts, partridges, geese also, and all other birds of this class. But the birds which are forbidden, you will find to be wild and carnivorous, tyrann tyrannizing over the others by the strength which they possess, and cruelly obtaining food by preying on the tame birds enumerated above, and not only so, but they seize lambs and kids and injure mankind too, whether dead or alive. And so by naming them unclean, he gave a sign by means of them that those for whom the legislation was ordained must practice righteousness in their hearts and not tyrannize over anyone in reliance upon their own strength, nor rob them of anything, but steer their course of life in accordance with right ruling, 
just as the tame birds already mentioned, consume the different kinds of pulse that grow upon the earth and do not tyrannize or tyrannize to the destruction of their own kindred. And if you think about the illusions there, you have the eagle that's ruling in Rome, right? And you have the dove that fled to the wilderness, all illusions of things that happened with the coming of the Puritans and other believers to America trying to flee religious persecution. So other pictures here. There's a lot more about that. And even in reality, I'll give you an example. I don't know about everyone, but you can probably do it for everywhere. In the ancient history of Caledonia, there is specifically mentioned an indigenous type of cattle. The cattle, like the cows, are the domesticated animals that are herd animals that go along with things. And the one that was indigenous to the land was completely white with a black tongue. And if you're ever familiar with the Highlanders or anything, or um, uh, the characteristic of these types of people, they're very kind. They're very loving. They follow the laws of the altar exactly. They're very, very loving people. And they always, they did the right thing. But they would say things that would cause them problems. And it's even reflected in the very animal of the country, if you will. In that same vain without any difference you think about the uh the main animal for america is the bald eagle white head brown body right but to continue here it says our legislator taught us therefore that it is by such methods as these that indications are given to the prudent that they must be righteous and affect nothing by violence and refrain from tyrannizing over others in reliance upon their own strength. For since it is considered unseemly even to touch such unclean animals, as we have, or as has been mentioned, on account of their particular habits, ought we not to take every precaution, lest our own characters should be destroyed in to the same extent? Wherefore, all the rules which he has laid down with regard to what is permitted in the case of these birds and other animals, he has enacted with the object of teaching us a moral lesson. For the division of the hoof and the separation of the claws are intended to teach us that we must discriminate between our individual actions with a view to the practice of virtue. For the strength of our whole body and its activity depend upon our shoulders and limbs. Therefore, he compels us to recognize that we must perform all our actions with discrimination according to the standard of righteousness. And he, he compares it with the limbs here because you have two equal weights and measures, right? more especially because we have been distinctly separated from the rest of mankind. For most other men defile themselves by promiscuous intercourse, thereby working great inequity, and whole countries and cities pride themselves upon such vices. For they not only have intercourse with men, but they defile their own mothers and even their daughters. But we have been kept separate from such sins, and the tribes who have been separated in the aforementioned way are also characterized by the lawgiver as possessing the gift of memory. For all animals, which are cloven-footed and chew the cud, represent to the initiated the symbol of memory. For the act of chewing the cud is nothing else than the reminiscence of life and existence. For life is wont to be sustained by means of food. Wherefore he exhorts us in the scripture also in these words. You shall surely remember Yahuwah that wrought you, or that wrought in you those great and wonderful things. For when they had properly conceived... They are manifestly great and splendorous. 
first the construction of the body and the disposition of the food and the separation of each individual limb and far more the organization of the senses the operation and invisible movement of the mind the rapidity of its particular actions and its discovery of the arts display an infinite resourcefulness Wherefore, he exhorts us to remember that the aforesaid parts are kept together by L-breathed power with consumerate skill. For he has marked out every time and place that we may continually remember the L who rules and preserves. For in the matter of meats and drinks, he bids us first of all offer part as a sacrifice and then forthwith enjoy our meal. Moreover, upon our garments he has given us a symbol of remembrance, and in like manner he has ordered us to put the l breathe oracles upon our gates and doors as a remembrance of Elohim, and upon our hands too he expressly orders the symbol to be fastened. Now, clearly showing that we ought to perform every act in righteousness. Now, right here, you have in the land today where they'll commonly literally wrap up a little portion of written scripture in a box and they'll, they'll wrap up their arm with a leather band and they'll do the same thing around their forehead with these things in a very literal fashion. But it's missing the point of having his word in your mind and in what you're doing. That was the whole intention of what he said. Remembering our own creation and above all the fear of Elohim. He bids men also when lying down to sleep and rising up again to meditate upon the works of El, not only in word, but by observing distinctly the change and impression produced upon them when they are going to sleep and also their waking, how L breathe and incomprehensible the change from one of these states to the other is. The excellency of the analogy in regard to discrimination in memory has now been pointed out to you, according to our interpretation of the cloven hoof and the chewing of the cud. For our laws have not been drawn up at random, or in accordance with the first casual thought that occurred to the mind, but with a view to truth and the indication of right reason. For by means of the directions which he gives with regard to meats and drinks and particular cases of touching, he bids us neither to do nor listen to anything thoughtlessly, nor to resort to unrighteousness or injustice, by the abuse of the power of reason. In the case of the wild animals, too, the same principle may be discovered. For the character of the weasel and of mice and such animals as these, which are expressly mentioned, is destructive. Mice defile and damage everything not only for their own food, but even to the extent of rendering absolutely useless to man whatever it falls in their way to damage. The weasel class, too, is peculiar, for besides what has been said, it has a characteristic which is defiling. It conceives through the ears and brings forth through the mouth. And it is for this reason that like practice is declared unclean in men. For by embodying in speech all that they receive through the ears, they involve others in evils and work no ordinary impurity. Being themselves altogether defiled by the pollution of impiety, and your king, as we are informed, does quite right in destroying such men. These would be known as the whisperers or busybodies that go and gossip who have to tell everyone whatever they hear and they just can't keep things to themselves. That is the 
parable in the weasel. It's not about abstaining from doing things that you're not supposed to be doing anyways. That being intimate with your your significant other or your your spouse, your husband and wife together, it's meant for procreation. It's very clearly distinguished or spoken of in the recognitions of Clement by Kepha, where he says chastity is one of the greatest virtues in all of its capacities. But right here, Ab willing, you can see the intention of what these animals were meant to convey. But we'll go ahead and continue. It says, then I said, I suppose you mean the informers, for he constantly exposes them to tortures and to painful forms of death. Yes, he replied, these are the men I mean, for to watch for men's destruction is an unset apart thing. And our law forbids us to injure anyone either by word or deed, which is why Shaul says in his epistle that if at all possible, be at shalom with all men. But if you can't be at shalom with them, you're to turn the other cheek and not return reviling to reviling, right? Or evil for evil. My brief account of these matters ought to have convinced you that all our regulations have been drawn up with a view to righteousness and that nothing has been enacted in the scripture thoughtlessly or without due reason. And that's why the epistle says that the Torah was a trainer unto righteousness until these times came where he poured out his Ruach on all flesh. And it was the added bonds that were explicitly put on there to teach them these things in parable form. But its purpose is to enable us throughout our whole life and in all our actions to practice righteousness before all men, being mindful of El Shaddai, and so concerning meats and things unclean, creeping creatures and wild beasts, the whole system aims at righteousness and righteous relationships between man and man. He seemed to me to have made a good defense on all points, or on all the points, for in the reference also to the calves and the rams and goats which are offered. He said that it was necessary to take them from the herds and flocks and sacrifice tame animals and offer nothing wild, that the offerers of the sacrifices might comprehend the symbolic meaning of the lawgiver and not be under the influence of an arrogant self-consciousness. For he who offers a sacrifice makes an offering also of his own inner being in all its moods. I think that these particulars with regard to our discussion are worth narrating and on account of the sanctity and natural meaning of the law, I have been induced to explain them to you clearly, philocrates, because of your own devotion to learning. And Philocrates is the gentleman that Arist Aristes wrote his letter to. And that's why it came down in history. The best part of these letters is hands down the question and answer section, although the, the discussion here with the Kohen is also a wonderful part. But the, the question and answer part is rather wonderful. I highly suggest everyone to read it. But Aristes was so impressed with it he went to the official recorders of the daily affairs of the sovereign so he can get an exact word for word of what happened to, to narrate properly. All right, real quick, I'm going to pause and we're going to see what you guys want to do. All right, so to continue back with the discussion from the recognitions now that you have a little more context, some of these other things that are mentioned if you take the time to think about them, and in particular, what scripture says about these things, like the seed is the word, what the birds represent, what sand represent, what stars represent, all these different things are parables for different aspects of creation or different things that he's done or he's created and affected in life. 
to teach us and to show us things. So it's pretty amazing. The more you do that, the more you can see it. If you don't believe scripture, then these things don't have any meaning to you whatsoever. It's all just jumbled nonsense. But if you actually believe what he said, then you start doing that. It's going to click and all this stuff is going to open up for you. It's pretty awesome. But here he goes on to the germination of seeds. And again, these, this is Clement's brother. I believe it's Achilla talking to or doing discourse with his father at the time before they know it's him. And he's using examples of creation to show there is a creator. But chapter 26, it says, and what occasion is there to mention more instances in which Yahuwah has ordained the production of animals to be affected in various ways? That order being superseded, that is thought to be assigned by nature, from which not an irrational course of things, but one arranged by his own reason, might be invised or invinced. And in this also, there is not a full work of providence shown. When seeds sown and prepared by means of earth and water for the subsistence of men. For when these seeds are committed to the earth, the soil milks upon the seeds. And from its teats, the moisture that it has received into itself by the will of Elohim. For there is in water a certain power of the Ruach given by Elohim from the beginning. And that would be the Ruach of Elohim fluttering over the waters, possibly being mentioned. But in 4th Ezra or 2nd Baruch, possibly both, the creatures that were created came out of the waters. And it's in the waters that were renewed and reborn again. So this is the illusion that he's speaking of here. This is for there is in water a certain power of the Ruach, given by Elohim from the beginning, by whose operation the structure of the body that is to be begins to be formed in the seed itself, and to be developed by means of the blade and the ear. For the grain of seed being swelled by the moisture, that power of the Ruach that has been made to reside in water, running as an incorporeal substance through certain narrow passages of veins, excites the seeds to growth and forms the species of the growing plants. By means, therefore, of the moist element in which that vital ruach is contained and inborn, it is caused that not only is it revived, but also that an appearance and form in all respects like to the seeds that had been sown is reproduced. Now, who that has even a particle of sense will think that this method depends upon irrational nature and not upon Elohim's hokma or wisdom. Lastly, also these things are done in a resemblance of the birth of men, for the earth seems to take the place of the womb, into which the seed being cast is both formed and nourished by the power of water and ruach, as we have said before. But in this also, Yahuwah is to be admired, that he permits us to see and know the things that are made, but has placed in secrecy and concealment the way and manner in which they are done that they may not be competent to the knowledge of the unworthy, but may be laid open to the worthy and trustworthy when they will have deserved it. And when the Reformation had happened, you have the Industrial Revolution, the, the advances in sciences and technology and benefits and beneficence to men throughout the world because of it. And it was during that time that these things were actually discovered, how the womb, how someone's developed in the womb, and these things were actually made known. But it has come to both the worthy and the unworthy's attention, tragically. It says, but to prove by facts and examples that nothing is imparted to seeds of the substance of the earth, but that all depends upon the element of water, 
and the power of the Ruach that is in it. Suppose, for example, that a hundred talents weight of earth are placed in a very large trough, and there are sown in it several kinds of seeds, either of herbs or of shrubs, and that water enough is supplied for watering them, and that that care is taken for several years, and that the seeds that are gathered are stored up, for example, of corn or barley or other sorts separately from year to year, until the seeds of each sort amount to a hundred talents weight. Then also let the stalks be pulled up by the roots and weighed. And after all these have been taken from the trough, let the earth be weighed. It will still give back its hundred talents weight undiminished. Whence then will we say that all that weight and all that quantity of different seeds and stalks has come? Does it not appear without doubt that it has come from the water? For the earth retains entirely what is its own, but the water that has been poured in all through nowhere, or sorry, but the water that has been poured in all through, though is nowhere, or poured in all through is nowhere, sorry, on account of the powerful virtue of Elohim's condition, which by one species of water both prepares the substances of so many seeds and shrubs and forms their species and preserves the kind while multiplying the increase. So in the, in the way that the water influences all the different types of seeds that produce after their own kind is a picture of what the Ruach does as well, is what it's pointing out here. Can we stop for a moment just to consider what we just heard? That we live in Washington State, where are loaded. I mean, I look everywhere and there's trees all about. And... Uh, it is, it's beautiful to me. It's a miracle that these trees are here. And if you take a piece of land and keep making corn, eventually you'll quit making corn because you'll lose all the nutrition. But that doesn't happen in nature. It's, we are surrounded by an incredible miracle of growth. It is just, uh, what a wonderful day of the week to stop and, and consider uh the, the flowers why do flowers smell so enticing uh yet have thorns uh, the, the beauty of nature the miracle of nature how anyone can deny a creator is just absolutely mind-boggling i agree And it, nature does everything to make it be work like that. Like the, the, the leaves all fall from the trees and then they, they become compost for, to feed the trees. Absolutely. And everything he does is for purpose, all the, what they call biodiversity and symbiotic relationships in, in nature are just other things that prove that we have a, a wonderful creator who looks out for the benefit of all his creatures, right? The people who would gainsay that don't even want to discuss nature. All they want is to have their own foolish ideas propagated before men for pride or whatever. But you notice none of them... Uh, uh, want to get into what nature there i don't know if i've mentioned there's a, a the joke about the or the comic about the men scientists come to the creator and say okay we don't need you anymore we've discovered how to make life we can make people ourselves and he says oh really have you done so let, let, let's see you they says well okay we'll we'll start first so so they grab a handful of dirt and start to run it through their machines and he says i i, I get your own dirt they don't want to go to nature to try and discuss it because they lose immediately. Right. The truth self-evident doesn't really need anyone to stand for them, but people will either come to and acknowledge the truth or not. That's essentially how it works out. 
if you want to know that there's an, a creator, just look at the uh, what they call the irreducible complexity of a cell. There's so many yeah. parts and so many diverse things within a single cell that it's impossible to not have a contriver that intentionally made it. They know these things, but it's not it's not talked about from amongst the people because then the people might actually believe in what he said. That's the tragic thing, but that's why we share. That's why uh, all of us should become sincere and wanting to share the truth with others for that sole purpose that they would actually have a heart for looking and loving the truth. I uh, remember when Bill Nye, the science guy, had a discussion with uh, uh, one of the uh, writers of uh, it was one of the creation books, but uh, on it, uh, when they had this discussion, Bill Nye never bothered to bring any science. He just simply uh, uh, mocked and uh, made little jokes about creation, but he never once tried to refute it. He just laughed at it. Ha, ha, ha. He has I saw him the other day. Pardon? He has nothing. No, he, exactly. All he has is his own ignorance displayed. But it's, it's so sad the, that what is professed to be wisdom is such, really such foolishness. It's just sad. Sad. It is. That's uh, if you remember, you go back a little bit in this book. We've already covered the discourses between Shimon Kepha and Simon the Magician. Yeah, you can see the two types of characteristics in on display and evident for everybody, being like our Mashiach and following after a humble example of how you should be, and then being an adversary to others and and contriving things and just doing to, to win an argument or to get the upper hand like Simon was trying to do. So it, it really not thinking beyond what's written. If you've always tied back in with scripture, it teaches us these things to look out for, but it again, ties back to, if you really believe, if you believe what he said, you're going to do it. And then when you do it, you start to comprehend it. I, I, I have a, an issue with the words believe and faith with all words being defined in our, in our society, our enlightened society, that uh, to have faith doesn't mean intellectual. It, it means physical response. Same with uh, belief and faith the same way. They're not just words. They are uh, lifestyles, actions, but that's not what the, the world wants to think. So many people say they believe our Messiah. They believe in a creator. But the corresponding action, as James would say, you know, uh, I show you my faith by my works. It's, it really is. Uh, he said we're supposed to live it before these people. Sometimes I find it very, very difficult. I'm forever in consternation over the Catholic holidays. Belief doesn't require them to do anything. Not the way they define it, no. Yep. Um, I was still recording, I'm sorry. Do you, can we finish reading this a little bit before we have to go, do you mind? Please, please do. <laughs> He, this, I believe it's like I said, this is Achilla, and he's still doing the discourse trying to show how the things in creation point out the reality of our creator. And now he's getting into the, the body of a man. <clears throat> this is from all these things. I think it is sufficiently and abundantly evident that all things are produced, and the creation consists by a designing sense and not by the irrational operation of nature. But let us come now, if you please, to our own substance, that is, the substance of man, who is a small world, a microcosm, in the great world. And let us consider with what reason it is compounded, and from this especially you will comprehend the chokmah, or wisdom, of the Creator. 
For although man consists of different substances, one mortal and the other immortal, meaning his body and his inner being, yet by the skillful contrivance of the Creator, their diversity does not prevent their union, and that although the substances be diverse and alien, the one from the other, for the one is taken from the earth and formed by the Creator, but the other is given from immortal substances. And if you're not familiar, our inner beings, all the souls of the righteous, if you will, were created with the messengers and, and everyone on the first day as the, uh, was that the fourth work of the first day in chapter two of the book of Yobelin. So it, it mentions in the, the recognitions of Clement elsewhere that the inner being of man predates his creation. And this is true for everybody. And here you see another witness of that. This is for the one is taken from the earth and formed by the creator, but the other is given from immortal substances. And yet the honor of its immortality is not violated by this union, nor does it as some think consist of reason, desire, and passion, but rather such affections seem to be in it by which they may be moved in each of these directions. For the body which consists of bones and flesh takes its beginning from the seed of a man, which is extracted from the marrow by warmth and conveyed into the womb as into a soil, to which it adheres and is gradually moistened from the fountain of the blood, and so is changed into flesh and bones, and is formed into the likeness of him who injected the seed. And mark in this the work of the designer, how he has inserted the bones like pillars, on which the flesh might be sustained and carried. Then again, how an equal measure is preserved on either side, that is, the right and the left, so that foot answers to foot, hand to hand, and even finger to finger, so that each agrees in perfect equality with each, and also eye to eye and ear to ear, which not only are suitable to and matched with each other, but also are formed fit for necessary uses. For hands, for instance, are so made to, as to be fit for work, the feet for walking, the eyes protected with the sentinel eyebrows to serve the purpose of sight. And again, keeping everything in parable form with scripture, if you have two witnesses, you confirm every matter. In reality, when you have two eyes, you can see depth perception clearly. But if you're missing an eye, you cannot discern depth at all. It's like a flat screen. So you, it's not a trustworthy witness in reality. The same thing with having one ear or some other means where you're not able to have a full confirmation of the things that are going on. This is the ears so formed, hearing that like a symbol, they vibrate the sound of the word that falls upon them and send it inward, and transmit it even in the comprehension of the heart. Whereas the tongue striking against the teeth in speaking performs the part of a fiddle bow. The teeth also are formed, some for cutting and dividing the food, and handing it over to the inner ones. And these, in their turn, bruise and grind it like a mill, that it may be more conveniently digested when it is conveyed into the stomach. For this reason, they are also called grinders. And I don't know why the translator chose to do that, but molar is the, the same meaning as a grinder, but grinder isn't what we call them. We do call them molars though. The nostrils also are made for the purpose of collecting, inspiring and expiring air that by the renewal of the breath, the natural heat that is in the heart may, by means of the lungs, 
be either warmed or cooled, as the occasion may require, while the lungs are made to abide in the breast, that by their softness they may soothe and cherish the vigor of the heart, in which the life seems to abide. The life, I say, not the Ruach. And what will I say of the substance of the blood, which proceeding as a river from the fountain, and first born along in one channel, and then spreading through innumerable veins, as through canals, irrigates the whole territory of the, of the man's body with vital streams, being supplied by the agency of the liver, which is placed in the right side for effecting the digestion of food and turning it into blood. But in the left side is placed the spleen, which draws to itself and in some way cleanses the impurities of the blood. And real quick, another reference to a man's body and the things that it alludes to or information about it is found in the different authors of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, which is a collected writing of the different deathbed statements of the Twelve Patriarchs, the sons of Yaakov. They gathered their children and brothers that were remaining and spoke to them before dying. And this was what we have that was left from the recording of it. The version that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Testament of Louis, for example, has an entire paragraph on the actual details of the prayer, instructions and things that he got, where in the version that we had from the Greek translation just has the sentence that he prayed to, to Yahuwah, right? So we have an abridged version of some of the writings, but it generally has the same information and you can find a lot of it in there. There's, I believe in the Testament of Asher and maybe Naphtali and some of the other ones, they talk about different parts of the body and different things of that nature. Gad mentions it as too, as well. <clears throat> but it says, what reason also is employed in the intestines, which are arranged in long circular windings that they may gradually carry off the refuse of the food, so as neither to render places suddenly empty, and so not to be hindered by the food that is taken afterwards. But they are made like a membrane that the parts that are outside of them may gradually receive moisture, which if it were poured out suddenly would empty the internal parts and not hindered by a thick skin, which would render the outside dry and disturb the whole fabric of man with distressing thirst. Moreover, there is a wonder of the female form and the cavity of the womb, which is most suitable for receiving and cherishing and vivifying the germ. Who does not believe that it has been made as it is by reason and foresight? Because in that part alone of her body, the female differs from the male, in which the fetus being placed is kept and cherished. And again, the male differs from the female only in that part of his body in which is the power of injecting seed and propagating mankind. And in this there is a great proof of providence from the necessary difference of members. How marvelous it is that where, under a likeness of form, there is found to be diversity of use and variety of office. For males and females equally have teats or breasts, but only those of the female are filled with milk, that as soon as they have brought forth, the infant may find nourishment suited to him. But if we see the members in man arranged with such method, and that in all the rest of creation there is seen to be similarity of form and a difference only in those in which their use requires a difference. And we neither see anything superfluous nor anything wanting in man nor in woman anything deficient or in excess. Who will not from all these things acknowledge the operation of reason 
and the hokma or wisdom of the creator. And it says, with this agrees also, the reasonable difference of other animals, and each one being suited to its own use and service. This also is testified by the variety of trees and the diversity of herbs, varying both in form and juices. This also is asserted by the change of seasons, distinguished into four periods, and the circle closing the year with certain hours, days, months, and not deviating from the appointed reckoning by a single hour. Hence in account, sorry, hence in short, the age of the world itself is reckoned by a certain and fixed account and a definite number of years. But you will say, when was the world made and why so late? This you might have objected or objected though it had been made sooner. For you might say, why not also before this? And so going back through unmeasured ages, you might still ask, and why not sooner? But we are not now discussing this, why it was not made sooner, but whether it was made at all. For if it is obvious that it was made, it is necessarily the work of a powerful and supreme creator. And if this is evident, it must be left to the choice and judgment of that all-knowing creator when he should please to make it. Unless indeed you think that all this chokma or wisdom, which has constructed the immense fabric of the world and has given to the several objects their forms and kinds, assigning to them a habit not only in accordance with beauty, but also most convenient and necessary for their future uses. Unless I say, you think that this alone has escaped it, that it should choose a convenient season for so magnificent a work of creation. He has doubtless a certain reason and evident causes why and when and how he made the world, but it were not proper that these should be disclosed to those who are reluctant to inquire into and comprehend the things that are placed before their eyes meaning you don't throw the hidden pearls before the unworthy, right? And to testify of his providence. For those things that are kept in secret and are hidden within the senses of chokmah or wisdom, as in a royal treasury, are laid open to none but those who have learned of him, with whom these things are sealed and laid up. It is Yahuwah Elohim, therefore, who made all things, and himself was made by none. But those who speak of nature instead of Elohim, and declare that all things were made by nature, do not perceive the mistake of the name that they use. For if they think that nature is irrational, it is most foolish to suppose that a rational creature can pre can proceed from an irrational creator. But if it is reason, that is logos, by which it appears, or that would be debar, the word, right? By which it appears that all things were made. They change the name without purpose when they make statements concerning the reason of the creator. If you have anything to say to these things, my father, say on. All right, and then I think we have only two more chapters, and that'll be the end of this book, or yeah, the end of that contest. So we'll finish this real quick and then wrap it up. <clears throat> this is when Nasita had thus spoken. I said Akila twice, I'm sorry. The old man answered, You indeed, my son, have conducted your arrangement, or your argument rather, wisely and vigorously. So much so that I do not think the subject of providence could be better treated. But as it is now late, I desire to say some things tomorrow in answer to what you have argued. And if on these you can satisfy me, I will confess myself a debtor to your favor. And when the old man said this, Kepha rose up, then one of those present, 
a chief man of the Laodiceans, requested of Kepha and us that he might give the old man other clothes instead of the mean and torn ones that he wore. Kepha and we embrace this man, praising him for his honorable and excellent intention. And Kepha said, we are not so foolish and disrespectful as not to bestow the things that are necessary for bodily uses upon him to whom we have committed so precious words. And we hope that he will willingly receive them as a father from his sons. And also, we trust that he will share with us our house and our living. While we said this, and that chief man of the city strove to take the old man away from us with the greatest urgency and with many blandishments. While we the more eagerly strove to keep him with us, all the people cried out that it should rather be done as the old man himself pleased. And when silence was obtained, the old man with an oath said, Today I will stay with no one, nor take anything from anyone, lest the choice of the one should prove the sorrow of the other. Afterwards these things may be, if so it seem right. And when the old man had said this, Kepha said to the chief man of the city, Since you have shown your good will in our presence, it is not right that you should go away sorrowful, but we will accept from you favor for favor. Show us your house and make it ready so that the discussion that is to be tomorrow may be held there, and that any who desire to be present to hear it may be admitted. When the chief man of the city heard this, he rejoiced greatly, and all the people also heard it gladly. And when the crowds had dispersed, he pointed out his house, and the old man also was preparing to depart. But I commanded one of my attendants to follow the old man secretly and find out where he stayed. And when we returned to our lodging, we told our brothers all our dealings with the old man. And so, as usual, we supped and went to sleep. All right, I think with that, it's an excellent place to stop and we will continue next time. So thank you all for your sharing and Shabbat Shalom. We will see you all next week. You have a wonderful week. Shabbat Shalom.